wooden gate in the wall you never saw before. Say please before you open the latch. Go through, walk down the path. A red metal imp hangs from the green painted front door as a knocker. Do not touch it, it will bite your fingers. Walk through the house, take nothing, eat nothing. However, if any creature tells you that it hungers, feed it. If it tells you that it is dirty, clean it. If it cries to you that it hurts, if you can, ease its pain. Thus begins the poem Instructions by Neil Gaiman, an English fantasy writer, explaining the rules by which one should live if you should ever find yourself in a fairy tale. <laughs> These are the web of laws that you need to obey if you're going to emerge triumphant from the realm of folk and fable. But in genres that are so defined by breaking the rules, by imagining the impossible, we might be surprised to find so many laws driving the plot of fairy tale, fantasy, and science fiction. For example, going back to my childhood, the classic movie Gremlins, we learn that no matter how much it cries and begs, you mustn't feed a gremlin after midnight. <laughs> or the cries of Chief Engineer Scotty in Star Trek that I can't break the laws of physics, Captain. <laughs> I'll save my Scottish accent for later. <laughs> <laughs> mythology, too, is full of rules. Celtic mythology, for example, laid out a system of gyasa, taboos that should never be broken upon all of its heroes and kings. Now, while these rules may often have seemed arbitrary, for example, never eating dog meat, never wearing a rainbow cloak at sunrise, never sleeping away from home for nine nights. Yet violation of these gyasa usually resulted in tragedy. And just as tales of myth often hinge around rules, so too rules are often founded on myths. After living in this country for nearly five years, perhaps I can mention the legendary status of the Founding Fathers. <laughs> the mythic quality that the Declaration of Independence has, that all men are created equal. And then contrast that, perhaps, to the more legal agenda of the American Constitution. Law and myth are intertwined, each giving birth to the other. And so it is we find it in our parasha this week, Parashat Mishpatim. The parasha begins with a whole series of laws. We're following on from last week where we read the Ten Commandments, God proclaiming laws from Sinai. Here we get a complex series of laws. We hear laws of slaves, laws of damages. We read, uh, for example, he that strikes his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. I did that one for my parents. <laughs> If anyone grazes their livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in someone else's field, the offender must make restitution from the best of their own field or vineyard. Or another one, if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal, charge no interest. A series of very practical laws about engaging in the world, making it a better place. And yet the parasha ends deep in the realm of mythology. Moses, Aaron, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 elders ascend the mountain and see an amazing vision. We read, And they saw the God of Israel, and beneath God's feet was like the forming of a sapphire brick and like the appearance of the heavens for clarity. How can these elements exist side by side? How can we connect the mythic and the legal? Especially when law is so much about social norms, about order in society, it's about logic, the real world maintaining boundaries that exist so society can function. And yet myth is about the mavericks, the heroes, the leaders, concerned with the world of extremes, in which boundaries are routinely crossed. 
For me, this question is at the heart of my Judaism and my rabbinate. How can I unite my two great loves, the logical and the fantastical, the Talmud and the Zohar, the side of me that loves outlandish and often transgressive stories about demons and sea monsters, and believes that these tales are those that get to the deepest element of what it means to be human. And the side of me that believes in the power of Salaka to transform our regular human lives through precisely defined action, the side of me that loves the intricate logical debates of that legal system. How can we bridge this gap? How can we understand the relationship? The hybrid nature of Torah, I think, is expressed by Rashi in his first comment on the Torah. He quotes from Midrash Yal Kitzimon, and he says, uh, Rashi asks, why does the Torah begin here with creation, here with the flood, with the stories of the patriarchs? Surely, he says, we should have, should have started later. We should have started with the first real law, the law of Torah, the must be son. His answer, justification of Jewish claims to the land of Israel, is less interesting to me than the assumption. Sometimes myth, I think, can seem irrelevant, hard to decipher, and, frankly, bizarre. But I feel the power of that myth, the visceral excitement of the stories that set my heart racing and my imagination aflame. Surely we need both. In fact, the Talmud itself does intermingle halakha and haqadah, flowing from one into the other as the subject moves them. And one particular story in Baba Kama 60b highlights the importance of keeping both of these traditions. plucked out all his white hairs, the old one plucked out all his black hairs, <laughs> and in the end, he was completely bald. <laughs> Trying to remove one, picking out Agadah from the sea of Halakha or vice versa, results in no tradition at all. And like Rav Yitzhak, we have to find a way to combine the two, bring out the mythic from the legal, and find the ritual that flows from our legends. And I think the parable here is most helpful because while it implies that one of the two is older, notice that he doesn't tell us which. <laughs> is Agadah more ancient? Is it that stories spawn laws out of them, arising from a need to enact the principles encoded in that myth? Or is it that Halakha is more ancient? Law exists first, and maybe the myth comes along to justify and explain it and give some meaning behind it. The, uh, we never find out, Rav Yitzchak doesn't say. And in fact, I think both are true. Both evolve together, both grow out of each other, something like the chicken and the egg. This was the subject uh, Chaim Bialik spoke about in his essay, uh, Halakha Agada. He wrote, uh, he, he, unlike Rashi, was not trying to justify, um, he was trying to justify Halakha to people who were really in love with Agada. Whereas Rashi kind of had the opposite sense in his mind. 
He was speaking to the modern Jewish artists who felt that perhaps while Agadah was something living and vibrant, that Halakha was something stagnant and fossilized. Bialik wrote about the relationship in this way. He said, Halakha is the crystallization, the ultimate and inevitable quintessence of Agadah. Agadah is the content of Halakha. Agadah is the plaintive voice of the heart yearning as it wings its way to heaven. Halakha is the resting place where for a moment that yearning is satisfied and stilled. And for me, mythology as a subset of Haggadah typifies exactly this process. That myth is the timeless expression of the human soul, whose cry bursts into the reality of the universe and crystallizes as ritual, as halakha, a way of trying to bind the infinite and the eternal to that which is necessarily time-bound and ephemeral. Now, some of us may find ourselves identifying with Rashi, feeling that all these crazy stories are perhaps a little silly, hard to understand, longing for some decent logical halakhic debate that we can get our head into to clearly define terms and parameters. And I think some of us here may identify with those artists that Bialik was speaking to, that myths and legends get our blood pumping, but we may feel bored and constrained by notions of obligation, by a life that is really bound by halakha. As I set out in my rabbinet, I hope to create communities that feel inspired by both halves of our tradition, who can keep ritual laws and nevertheless feel the blood-pumping legends beating below the surface, who know the great legends and can feel that they are a source of inspiration to take real action in the world. Because in the end, all our myths and all our laws mean nothing if we do not respond to the voices of pain and need all around us. If any creature tells you that it hungers, feed it. If it tells you that it is dirty, clean it. And if it cries to you that it hurts, 